Poetry Love Media, where we share Christ-centered content via to your screen. Um, I just couldn't help but to prayerfully put together this PowerPoint presentation on the concerns, the sincere major concerns that I have with messages that evolve time setting, whether it's of Christ in return or events or anything along those lines that point to that, whether it's subtle or not directly. Um, I'm going to share in this presentation just that. I, but before that, I'd like to start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your loving kindness and tender mercies and help us to truly um, study your words and to give an answer for the reason for our faith. I thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do. Be with me. Um, I am nothing. I am simply just a vessel. And thank you, Lord, for your guiding words in your in scripture and also your spirit, who is our ultimate teacher. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. The name of this presentation is called Exposing the Dangers of Time Setting. All right. So in this presentation, we'll understand the following. Uh, we will look at biblical examples, strictly from Bible, um, of events mentioned and that took place. Dangers of fanaticism from a biblical perspective. What special group will be revealed? The timing of Christ's return and supporting spirit of prophecy quotes that surround time setting. Now, there are many biblical uh, examples uh, in regards to when God reveals messages to his people. But of course, that was all before 1844. And even that, uh, furthermore, we understand that there's no further time uh, setting or prophecies after 1844. Okay, um, so let's just get right into it. So here's a disclaimer. The following presentation is for educational and edifying purposes and is not um, any means an attack against the messenger, but the message presented. The views expressed in this presentation is strictly from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Quotes, uh, just a little discrepancy there. Should we say, it should say in this presentation, not presentations. Okay, well, let me continue. It's strictly from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Quotes, as well as history and its cause and effect as a result from time setting. Um, we are encouraged to be faithful watchmen and women in these last days in order to be ready for Christ's second coming. Now, before I continue, um, I did attend the Upper Room Retreat in Alabama. Uh, many of you have may have heard of Brother Jeremiah Davis, who I used to listen to his messages years ago, um, but have not listened to his messages for a long time, until up to now. Um, and I just had some concerns I just wanted to address. Um, I won't even get into what he presented. I won't even get into all that. But I'll just give you what the Bible says um, around the dangers of time setting. And I believe other uh, ministers have already talked on this vocally. Uh, you're also encouraged to stay tuned for uh, the ministry, Samuel Tucker, on 3, 3 a.m. Glad Tiding ministry on their YouTube channel, as they will also present um, this topic on year 2025, 2025 plus minus. 
But this, what I'm presenting today is strictly from a biblical perspective uh, in terms of what God's timing is. Okay, so we know the account of Noah and the Ark. One of the Bible examples I just only want to glean out for today's presentation uh, is Noah and the Ark. And let's take a look in Genesis chapter 6, verses 13 to chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis 6, verses 3, sorry, verses 13 to chapter 7, verse 10. And it says, And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come. So God mentions to Noah strictly, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So God makes it clear and says to Noah that he will destroy the earth. He doesn't give him a time specifically, but he did say that he will destroy the earth. He said in the future that this will take place. Then verse 14, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark and shall pitch it within without with pitch. And this is a fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits and height of it 30 cubits. A window shall thou make to the ark and in a cubit shall thou finish it above and the door of the ark shall thou set in the side thereof. With lower second and third story shall thou make it. And behold, I even I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven and everything that is in it, the earth shall die. So God makes it clear to Noah what will take place upon the earth, events that will take place. Notice he didn't give a timeline. He just simply stated that he will, this will happen. Okay. Um, now let's just um, fast forward here to verse, oh, let's go to verse chapter seven of Genesis, verse five to verse 10. So sick of time. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. So Noah was obedient. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came upon the earth. Now the Bible records he was 600 years old, but notice the Bible does not record that God told us specifically at 600 years old that the flood of waters will come upon the earth. He just strictly said that this will happen. But Noah, it just the Bible simply records that at 600 years old, the flood came down. Noah was just, just simply obedient. He just did what God said. He didn't speculate and try to figure out time frames and here, here and there. And then verse 7, and when Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him into the ark, because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts and of the beasts that are not clean and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two by two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. Verse 10. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. Okay. So um, that was that, that was in, emphasized. Notice the parallel. Jesus says that the days of Noah is equivalent to his second coming, or is like the days of Noah is like the second coming. Let's take a look there. In Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 to 39, it says, but of that day, this is Jesus speaking, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the son of man be. This is future tense. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all, all way, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So for what you understand, no one knows the day of hour. And there's wisdom in that because that's what makes him God, is for us to be ready now to search our hearts daily because probation could close at any time for anyone. In fact, the second coming of Christ, when someone dies, that's their second coming right there because that's it. Probation is closed for them, right? And I will 
cover it later in this presentation about the hundred for four thousand. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. So now Paul mentions about heresies among God's people. Let's take a look at Acts chapter fifteen, verses twenty-two to uh, twenty-four. It says. Then please it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas surnamed Barsabas and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this matter. The apostles and elders and brethren sent greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard, Verse 24, that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying. So up subverting also means here uh, unsettling your souls. OK, just to give you the description there in, in the same Bible reading from the King James Version, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. Okay, so here, this is the account of the debate um, and heresy about the circumcision that they must do so uh, in order to keep and keep the law. And this had caused unsettling in, in some and many during that time. So we see history repeating itself in different ways. Uh, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is a Bible study. So we pray that as we study, we stay, study with an open mind and a teachable spirit. Uh, verse seven, uh, 17. Now in this, this is at, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17 to 22. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Verse 19. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. What, have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. So, the disturbing thing for me when I attended the upper room retreat, and some can attest to this when it was mentioned that those who don't believe in this teaching um, about the 25, 20 plus minus, that they are scoffers and so forth. Um, and this, this is not biblical um, because the Bible even describes who are the scoffers in the end times. Uh, so that's just, I'll just leave that alone. But let's just go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 to 15. It says, this is when here we see that, uh, again, Paul warns against false, te false preaching. In verse 1, it says, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me? For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have despised you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And we'll see the word virgin later on in this study. In this study. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, okay, subtle, all right, keep that in mind. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a wit behind the very chiefest apostles. But though I be rude in speech, and yet in, and not, sorry, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thorough, thoroughly, thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. I, have I commanded an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you, I wanted and was chargeable to no man. 
For that which was lacketh to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied, and in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. So occasion, of course, means opportunity here. Verse 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their work. So Paul says very clearly, even those amongst our professed Christians or even amongst our faith, Satan can use in the end times as a peering of a preacher, a minister of righteousness or a, a minister who is righteous. Okay. But can still deceive if they're not careful. Okay. Um, so let's continue. So what about this special group who will know the time of Christ's second coming? Or, okay. Let's take a look at that. So let's take a look at Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 to 5. And it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with the harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man can learn that song, but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These, their mothers were virgins again, we see repeated. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithsoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruit unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now let's take a look at some of these characteristics that were outlined in Revelation 14, verse 1 to 5. Characteristic number one, we saw that it said have, they have their father's name written on their foreheads. Characteristic number two, they sung a new song. No man can learn the song. Their unique experience. So they had a unique experience. Okay, that's in Revelation 14, verse 3. Characteristics number three, they were not defiled with women, they were virgins. Revelation 14, verse four. And characteristics number four, they followed the lamb wherever he went. Revelation 14, verse four. Number five, they were redeemed as being the first fruit unto God and unto the lamb. Revelation 14, verse four. See also Hebrews 12, 23 and James 1, verse 18 on your spare time. I encourage you to go back and read these, these verses. And, verse, and then number six, in their mouth was found no guile or deceit. Guile means deceit. So they were found without, and they were found without fault, or they were without fault. And this is in Revelation 14, verse 5. So let's go step by step on each of these beautiful characteristics of the 144,000. So it says here that the 144,000 had the name of the Father written on their forehead. So what does that mean? So let's take a look at Revelation 14, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So we understand that those who receive the mark of the beast, as is taught often in public platforms, that uh, it's it's referring to those like our hands, our actions, right? We what we do, right? In receiving that mark, so our, our transactions, what we do tangibly with our hands, and our forehead is where our frontal lobe sits, where it's actually the seat of decisions, right? So we make decisions with our mind tangibly. For example, in Psalms 118, verse 11, it says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. So we hide and cherish God's word in our heart 
we meditate on bond upon the word of God, we will not sin. And sin is a transgression of God's law. So when we mentally and purposely in our hearts, in Daniel, it says in Daniel chapter one, it says that Daniel purposed in his heart that he will not defile himself of the king's delicacies. Okay. So what does the name mean? Name means God's character. Okay. It says they have the name of the father written on the forehead. So we could take a look at Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. It says, for unto us, a child is born unto us, a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. This is God's character. And oftentimes, um, even in the account of Jacob, when he wrestled with the angel, this we find this account here in, let's see here, let's go here quickly. Let's just go there. It's not in the slide, but I thought maybe I should share this too. When Jacob's name was changed to Israel, his character was changed because he had an encounter with the Lord. Okay. Yes, is, yes. So Genesis chapter 32, to be precise, Genesis 32, verses 24 to 27, it says, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of the joint, out of joint, as he wrestled with him. Verse 26. And he said, Let me go for the day break it. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And verse 27, and he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob, verse 28 now. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. And this is the reason why. For as a prince, thou has, has thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. Okay. So his name was changed. His character was changed because of his experience with God. Hope that makes sense. Okay. Um, so as you can see in the slide, it says, what does the name mean? Name means God's character. And in conclusion, the 144,000 perfectly reflect the character of God engraved in their minds. So let's go to number two characteristic here. The second characteristic, they sung a new song and no man can learn that song, it says. Of course, Psalmist David understood the concept of songs. For example, songs are considered songs. Songs are often written from experiences we have went through. For example, if you look at Exodus 15, there's actually a song that we, I usually like to sing with my son in our devotions. Exodus 15, one to four. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel the song unto the Lord and spoke saying, I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider has he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength, my strength and so. And he is become my salvation. He is my God. And I prepare him a habitation. My father's God. And I'll exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And I'll exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. But if you read Exodus 15, verse 1 to 19, this is the song of Moses. And I'm just singing the song from scripture. And this is a song. So it's a song of experience because they had overcame. The God delivered them from the hands of the Egyptians. And they crossed the Red Sea. And they sang a song of deliverance. So songs are, the purpose of songs are, are, are to express our experience and and what god has done right okay we could also look at psalms 120 all the way to 130 and in many other verses in revelation 15 verse 3 let's go there it says and they sang and they sing the song of moses the servant of god and the song of the lamb saying great and marvelous are thy works lord god almighty 
Just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. Saints. Now, this is after the seven plagues. So we know who uh, are the ones who sang the song of Moses is, is this special group that lived throughout the time of trouble. Okay. Now, let's go to characteristic number three. It says they were not defiled with women. What does women represent in the Bible? Let's take a look in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 28. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Verse 27, that he might present it himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that should be holy and without blemish. Verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. We know that Christ gave himself for us. He gave his body for his bride, the church, the woman, so that she could be holy and without blemish and present faultless. Okay. Uh, we love this in Jude. In Jude 24, 25, it says, it is not in my notes. It says here, now unto him, verse 24, 25 in Jude, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So we understand here, friends, that these were virgins. We look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 to 13, when Jesus talked about the distinction between the wise and the foolish virgins. Uh, these were representing God's people. The lamb represents the word of God. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. But I won't even get into that right now. That's not part of our study. But to get the context of virgins, these were um, people that were unspotted. They did not commit spiritual fornication or whoredom with other gods or other doctrines, if you will. Um, so not referring to sexuality per se, but referring to um, indoctrination or, or even putting any gods before them, everywhere along those lines. So let's look at number four. They followed the lamb wherever he went. Let's take a look at Ezekiel chapter one. Ezekiel chapter one, verses five, five to 20. It says, now this is the vision that uh, Ezekiel, that God gave to Ezekiel in referring to the four living creatures. But look at this. In, in, interesting uh, verse, these verses. Let's, let's take a look and listen to these verses. Also, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings, and their feet was straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass, and they had the hands of a man under the wings on their four sides and therefore had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went, they went everyone straight forward. Verse 10, as for the likeness of their faces, they, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion and on the right side. And they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Verse 11, thus were their faces and their wings were stretched forward. Two wings of everyone were joined one to another and two covered their bodies. Verse 12, and they went everyone straight forward. Now here's the real emphasis, verse 12. They went everyone straight forward. Whether, whither the spirit was to go, they went. And they turned not when they went. I'm gonna skip down to verse 20. Whither soever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. The description of the wheel in the middle of a wheel, you find this in verse 15 to verse 19 leading up to that verse. 
But the thing I want to really draw out from that is that they went, it says here, wherever the spirit was, they went. So they followed the lamb wherever he went. Okay. So these are the people who sought to only do the perfect will of God and follow him, whatever he commands them to do without questioning, without wavering. Let's go to number five. Now it says they were redeemed amongst the first fruits. What does this mean? Let's take a look at first Corinthians chapter 15 verses 15 to 24. And it says, Yay, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, who he raised not up, if so, be that the dead rise not, verse 16. For if the dead rise not, then it is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins, verse 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of men most miserable. Verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Verse 21, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Verse 23, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Verse. So as you can see here, um, it says in verse 23, that every man is on order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So Christ represents the first fruits of those who were dead, um, who were dead as a result of sin, as we saw of the first Adam, because Christ is our second Adam, which I won't get into now in this study. But if you look at the concordance and even the definition, we see that first fruits represent or means the first gathered fruits of a harvest offered to God in gratitude. Okay. And notice here, Christ was offered. So his, he was without spot nor wrinkle nor blemish. So he was accepted. And if you look in the Old Testament, everything that in the, um, the, event, the event of the first fruits and then the Pentecost, it's all in its exact order. Christ fulfilled all of those things that were outlined in the Old Testament. He was the first fruit that was accepted. And as a result, the Pentecost came. Um, but I want to begin to that for this study. But as you can see here, Christ represented the first fruits uh, because he was accepted. And um, not only that, he sinned not. He was without spot nor wrinkle. That's why the sanctuary is a powerful uh, mess, center of our message because in Psalm 77, 13, it says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Um, the sheep had to be offered without spot nor wrinkle, representing Christ Jesus. Okay, so in the strong Hebrew concordance, it says the first fruits of the crop. That's what simply means, okay? It's the first fruits of the crop. Number six, the last characteristics here. Their mouth was found with no guile, which also means deceit. In a strong concordance Hebrew definition, it comes to the word nasha, dissimulation, deceit. Okay, so we know that deceit is, there's no truth in deceit. Deceit is deception, okay? They were also faultless as Christ was faultless. We can look at Luke chapter 23, verse four. This is the account when when he when Christ was brought to Pilate and he was falsely accused. It says here in verse four, then Pilate said to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. OK, so the 144,000 parallels exact characteristics of Christ's ministry on earth. They had no fault. They had no guile, no deceit in their, in their mouths. OK, so now we're going to go into spirit of prophecy quotes on time setting and it's linked to fanaticism. Um, we know the account, uh, those who may have um, seen my presentation, if you go under the live window, you will find that I did a presentation on William Miller and uh, the, the charts and, and the prophecies and, and what led to the great disappointment. Uh, you may wanna check that video on your spare time, uh, but I want to get into that in depth here uh, but here, uh, this is in regards to uh, William Miller and the great disappointment. Now, William Miller was a great man of God. He was a humble farmer and so forth. But he he was an heir in some of his teachings. So 
As you can see here, we see this prophetic period is taken from CIHS 6.3. This prophetic period came to its close on October 22nd, 1844. The disappointment to those who expected to meet their Lord on that day was great. Hiram Edson, a careful Bible student in mid-New York State, describes what took place among the company of believers of which he was part. Now here what it says, our expectations were raised high and thus we looked for our coming Lord until the clock told 12 at midnight. The day had then passed and our disappointment had become a certainty. Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I'd never experienced before. It seemed that the loss of all earthly friends could have been no comparison. We wept and wept till the dawn, day dawn, okay? And it continues, I mused in my heart saying, my event experience has been the brightest of all my Christian experience. Has the Bible proved a failure? Is there no God, no heaven, no golden city, no paradise? Is all this but a cunning device fable? Is there no reality to our fondest hopes and expectations? So you see the danger of time setting or misinterpretation of events or what so have you, it could lead to disbelief, doubt, and even fear and pain, okay? And God knows this. And this continues here. I began to feel there might be light and help for us in our distress. I said to some of the brethren, let us go to the barn. We enter the granary, shut the doors about us and bow before the Lord. We prayed earnestly for we felt our necessity. We continued, continued in earnest prayer until the witness of the spirit was given that our prayers were accepted and the light should be given. Our disappoint, disappointment explained, made clear and satisfactory. So that's where the Adventist faith came about and was born because of a group of believers who sought earnestly in prayer and asking and had a teachable spirit, asking God to teach them what um, was a true clarity of 1844 and what took place in 1844, okay? And we all, those who may know, know that 1844 refers to Christ moving to the uh, his work in the heavenly, um, the most holy place, okay? But I won't get into that in the study, but you're encouraged to go in depth and study about that. Okay, so here are other quotes, some testimonies to the church, uh, volume 4, 307. Because the times repeatedly said have passed, the world is in more... So now remember, Ellen Wayne has a better understanding because she lived through the disappointment, the great disappointment. She now testifies uh, the dangers of time setting. And now hear this. Because the times repeatedly said have passed, the world is in a more decided state of unbelief than before in regard to the near event of Christ. We know that history repeats itself, friends. Let's continue. They look upon the failures of the time setters with disgust. And because men have been so deceived, they turn from the truth substantiated by the word of God that the end of all things is at hand. Okay. I understand that brother, here's a testimony about in last, this is taken from last day events, is about a brother that she is talking about here. Pretty similar along the lines that we may have heard, those who may have had attended along those lines. It says here, I understand that brother E.P. Daniels has, as it were, set time, stating that the Lord will come within five years. Now, I hope the impression will not go abroad that we are time setters. Let no such remarks be made. They do no good. Seek not to obtain a revival upon any such grounds, but let due caution be used in every word uttered the, that fanatical ones will not seize anything they can get to create an excitement and the spirit of the Lord be grieved. Stand that brother E.P. Daniels has, as it were, set time, stating that the Lord will come within five years. Similar to plus minus, it gives it, it gives when I when I heard that, friends, I'll be honest, it reminded me of that. You know, when you give a time frame or within or plus minus, it's subtle, it's very subtle, friends. It's very subtle. Then it says, Now I hope the impression will not go abroad that we are time setters. Let no such remarks be made, they do no good. Seek not to attain a revival upon any such grounds. But let due caution be used and every word uttered that fanatical ones will not seize anything that can get it to create an excitement and the spirit of the Lord be grieved. Okay. I had to reemphasize that quote twice um, because 
They say repetition deepens the impression, but I had to repeat that there. So this is taken from uh, 1TT 504.1. Many who have called themselves Adventists have been time setters. Time after time has been set for Christ to come, but repeated failures have been the result. The definite time of our Lord's coming is declared to be beyond the can of mortals. Even the angels who minister unto those who shall be heirs of salvation know not the day nor the hour. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew 24, verse 36. Because the times repeatedly said have passed, the world is in a more decided state of unbelief than more before in regard to the near advent of Christ. They look upon the failures of the time setters with disgust, and because men have so been deceived, they turn from the truth substantiated by the word of God that the end of all things is at hand. Again, this is repeated in another testimony. Those who so presumptuously preach definite time in so doing gratify the adversary of souls, for they are advancing in fidelity rather than Christianity. They produce scripture by false interpretation, show a chain of argument, which apparently proves their position, chain of arguments. Um, and I won't get into that. Those who were there, you know, they could use what others say um, and give, you know, just giving declarations here and there uh, to support their position. So this is what the quote is saying. But their failures show that they are false prophets, that they do not rightly interpret the language of inspiration. The word of God is truth and verity, but men have perverted its meaning. These errors have brought the truth of God for these last days into disrepute. Advances are derided by ministers of all denominations, yet God's servants must not hold their peace. Hence why I'm speaking today on this, on this matter, and many others are too. Then it continues, the signs foretold in prophecy are fast fulfilling around us. This should arouse every true fall of Christ to zealous action. We trembled for the churches that were to be subjected to the spirit, this spirit of fanaticism. My heart ached for God's people. Must they be deceived and led away by this false enthusiasm? I faithfully pronounced the warnings given me of the Lord, but they seem to have little effect except to make these persons of extreme views jealous of me. What does inspiration say about the 144,000 now? Soon we heard the voice of God like many waters, which gave us the day and hour of, his, of Jesus coming. The living saints, 144,000 in number, knew and understood the voice, while the wicked thought it was thunder and an earthquake. When God spoke the time, here God speaks the time to this group, he poured upon us the Holy Ghost, and our faces began to light up and shine with the glory of God, as Moses did when he came down from Mount Sinai. So it's not for us to determine who will be amongst the group, although we are encouraged in inspiration to strive amongst that group. But ultimately, God is the one who decides who will be able to, who he chooses to see fit to sleep during a time of trouble to be put to rest, or those who will be living amongst the time of trouble. God is the one who's the ultimate, he is the ultimate decider of that. But let us strive to be right with him and be ready. And the Lord is the boss of all that. <laughs> okay. And then it continues here. The 144,000 were all sealed and perfectly united. They were sealed and were perfectly united. On their foreheads was written God, New Jerusalem, and a glorious star containing Jesus' new name. At our happy holy state, the wicked were enraged and would rush violently up, up to lay hands on us to thrust us into prison. And when we would stretch forth the hand in the name of the Lord, and they would fall helpless to the ground. Then it was that the synagogue of Satan knew that God had loved us who could wash one another's feet and salute the brethren with a holy kiss, and they worship at our feet. This thing from Adventist Home, 543.2. The Lord has given me a view of other worlds. Wings were given me. So Ellen White is giving a vision of this, of this whole scenery, okay? This is powerful. Hear this. Wings were given me, and an angel attended me from the city to a place that was bright and glorious. The grass of the place was living green, and the birds were there 
there warbled a sweet song. The inhabitants of the place were of all sizes. They were noble, majestic, and lovely. They bore the express image of Jesus and their countenances beamed with holy joy, expressive of the freedom and happiness of the place. I asked one of them why they were so much more lovely than those on the earth. The reply was, we have lived in strict obedience to the commandments of God and have not fallen by obedience, uh, by disobedience, have not fallen by disobedience like those on the earth. I begged of my attending angel to let me remain in that place. I could not bear the thought of coming back to this dark world again. Then the angel said, you must go back. And if you're faithful, you with the 144,000 shall have the privilege of visiting all the world and viewing the handiwork of God. That's powerful. Okay. And oops, here's one uh, from Advantage Review and Sabbath Herald, the last quote. So what does inspiration say about this group? The refreshing from the presence of the Lord is near at hand. The loud cry of the third angel's message is upon us. How many are going to be able to receive it? Only those dear brethren or sisters who plead earnestly with God and are striving with all their might to overcome every sin. Okay, such are the ones that will come off victorious, but the careless and indifferent will fall out by the way and be lost sight of. I am astonished at myself often that knowing these things, I suffer myself so easily to be overcome by the insinuations of Satan. Oh, may the Lord give me and my strength to overcome every sin and finally come off victorious and stand with the 144,000 on Mount Zion, singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. My whole sympathies are with this people as a body and none at all with those self-righteous and fault-finding spirits which are manifest here and there, okay? My prayer is that I may not be overtaken in this way. That's my prayer for me and for all of us who may be listening. I would rather seek to be humble and in union with those whom I fully believe have the burden of this work laid upon them. Okay. I hope you're encouraged with these quotes, friends. This is not a source of condemnation, but a source of exhortation. So my appeal to us for us today, including um, Brother Jeremiah Davis and many others who they feel they have to set times or approximates and so forth. This is not to condemn. Okay. I, I love you. And I'm saying this in a troubling, trembling voice <laughs> with tears in my voice. Honestly, I have love, nothing but love. And we need to be faithful watchmen. I would love to know if, if, if I'm in error and teaching heresies that someone would pull me aside as well. I'll be, I would need that because I desire to be saved. And I, I'm sure we all want to be saved. We don't want to be in danger of fanaticism and we don't want to be in danger of being um, the Satan's tool or vessel. We want to be the Lord's vessel. So my appeal for us is that, um, that we open our hearts to him and we allow God to guide us and to have the mindset that let us not focus on the times, but rather focus on the times that we're living in to be ready. The purpose of these prophecies that are happening or the, uh, the current events that are taking place is to arouse us to repentance and arouse us to have a soul searching and yearning to overcome sin, every sin that is. That is my appeal for us, for me personally. This message was for me, trust me. Um, I am not better. I am, I am not claiming to be better than anyone out there. I have a lot to learn. And I just ask that you pray for me as well. But I'm sharing this called out of love, and the Lord has given me a strong impression to just share this. So um, let us be ready. May God help us. And let us start with the, let's have a word of prayer to close. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, um, if you want Bible study, uh, you can reach out to my email. I believe my email is also public on my YouTube channel. You could click there and you'll see my email. But this is the email. Um, let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for um, your love, your words, and tender mercies. And I pray that in my presentation, there was no, not a source of condemnation, but rather an exhortation and helping us to search our own hearts deeply so that we could be ready for your soon coming. Please be with Brother Jeremiah Davis and the whole team. Um, I was tremendously blessed attending the Upper Room Retreat, um, but I pray that you would touch the, the hearts of the ministers that truly the, the holy, holy surrender to you in all things, no matter how long we've been preaching publicly or ministries that we have, but that we truly surrender to you, who you, Lord, are the principal teacher of all things. So I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so that's it. Uh, this ends my presentation. Um, may God bless you. And if you're new to this channel, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Until then, God bless and bye for now. Get right with God, His pardon is free. Get right with God, He's waiting for thee. Our Jesus is calling, oh, come unto me. Take Him, O oh sin.